I will I will start recording now. It's super nice to to have another woman. Like I speak to a lot of guys, uh, mm-hmm. and you know, but but to be honest, like the all the female leaders are the most innovative and like the the best one. But don't tell tell the rest about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. I won't um, tell them. Cool. So first question was just you know coming from the SDRs. What what are you passionate about in in sales? Like in uh. In my job or just in life in general, I'm passionate about empowering people and giving them opportunities that they might not otherwise know about or have. So we did this exercise a while ago and we talked about what are our values, what's our purpose. And one of my values is advocating for people and you know, giving them access to opportunities that they don't have. So, I mean, just an example of that is like, I've gotten the chance to hire people who have been my servers at restaurants or shoe salesmen at Nordstrom's. Um, And something that I think is really incredible about sales development and about the tech space in general is that you get this opportunity to gain financial freedom uh, that you might not have even known existed and do a job that, you know, really builds up a lot of skills for so many different jobs and avenues that you want to go down. And so when I see SDRs come in, whether they're industry changers, whether they're parents returning to the workforce or people straight out of college who want to break into tech and don't really know what sales development is, it's an incredible opportunity to be a part of their journey and help shape their careers and empower them and challenge them to do the best work of their lives and work that's really fulfilling for them. I think you see SDRs when they come into the job and they they take it, they, they go after it with a force and they get so excited about what they're doing and they start learning the product and meeting other people within the company and booking meetings. You watch them build this confidence up that they never even knew existed and become the most confident version of themselves and, and it's through all of that rejection and failure and falling flat on your face. And then after, you know, after you've been an SDR for even just a year, you're a different person. You feel, if you ever need to get another job, you're not going to apply. I mean, you might apply, but you can just reach out directly to somebody on LinkedIn with a personalized message and get an interview. You know, I've helped my mom do that. And she was like, are you sure? Can we really reach out to a recruiter? And I said, trust me. You, you totally can, and that's how you'll actually get an interview. And so there's so many other examples, but there's so many things that it helps you, uh, skills that it builds, not just for sales, but for life and for yeah. other future jobs. And so I'm really passionate about bringing people in, giving them a really strong foundation, not throwing them to the wolves, you know, making it a challenging experience. It's not you know, easy to hit quota, you still have to work 100% and put in 100% to get to 100%, but giving them a path to get there and um, investing in them and just pouring into them when it comes to enablement and resources and career development so that they can grow, you know, grow as a professional and personally yeah. and get to the next level. So that was a long-winded answer to your question, no. but I that's, am very passionate about it. And that's why I'm in sales development. Yeah, I, I, can, I can feel it. It's, it's, it's great because, I mean, at some point you were an individual contributor, right? I'm just curious to understand, like, when, when did you sort of learn that this is like, this is my passion. I want to actually enable other people. I find satisfaction in not only booking meetings for myself, but actually enabling Peter, Paul and Mary in my team to crush mm-hmm. their quotas. Yeah. So I, I think I became a manager before I loved managing (laughs) and I picked by, um, the leader that I was going to work for. I had an opportunity to do do two different types of sales jobs at my company and then be a full-time manager. I was a team lead at the time, only managing three SDRs. I don't even think I had one-on-ones with them. I, (laughs) I, I had no idea what I was doing. And when I, I picked based on the boss for who I wanted to be like, and who I thought would really pour into me and invest into me. And so I picked SDR management and then I got a full team and I had nine people on my team and I felt like I was nagging all the time. I felt like, why don't, why do I have to tell you to make your cold calls? Come on. Yeah. This is the job. I can't Um, relate. (laughs) Yeah. And so, you know, there, there was a big turning point and I won't, it's a longer story. So I won't go into the whole 
um, background of it. But this big turning point was when I realized um, and had this epiphany that I can't actually make a difference on people's performance. Because I just thought, I just have to tell them what to do. And, and that doesn't really work. You really need people to buy in and get excited and feel like they're a part of this team. And not only a team, but the best team. And yeah. they're surrounded and we are going to be the best no matter what it takes. And when we got that team mentality, you know, the I won't go into the whole details of the story, but basically had an SDR who was on a plan. He had to hit quota this month. It was, we had a total breakthrough experience about why he wasn't going all out all the time to, 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 with his work to hit quota. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was, it was the last week of the month. He wasn't there. Yeah. And we went out onto the floor and the other SDRs could tell he had been emotional and, you know, everyone's just, we had these roll up stand up desks and everyone mm -hmm. just started rolling up their desks and they said, Hey, throw me a few accounts. Uh, I'll, I'll start dialing with you and everybody on the team. We started all calling at his accounts with him and his first two connects. He books two meetings and he runs around and we're all giving him high fives. Anyway, he ends up hitting quota and then hitting and exceeding it every single month for the next eight months before he gets promoted. And it was That's somebody who never hit quota ever in their entirety as an SDR for many, many months. And so just realizing, oh, you actually can motivate people and you actually can make a difference in the way that they perceive themselves and empower them and make them feel more confident to be able to feel feel confident that they can book a meeting and they can do this it mm -hmm. makes a difference so that's when I really started to love management um but yeah it, it's a big it took me a while maybe six months to really love it yeah well, that, this is this is an amazing amazing story I think uh, a lot of people can relate when you're like finally when it clicks you know things are falling mm -hmm. to to place what do you think happened in that moment you know you speak a lot of you know empowering people actually realizing like realizing their full potential i feel you're speaking about you help them you know realize okay i can do this as well right um yeah i um, don't know maybe well, you can you can I, i don't know maybe you have time to reflect upon it and said like this and i think this is what happened um if, if not we move on but i just no 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 i'm happy to answer it um, I've actually asked him before, because I've shared this story before, if I could share it and he's given me permission, I won't say his name. Um, but the big breakthrough was me, you know, we'd had this conversation multiple times, not, you know, what's going on, what's happening. And really what happened, we were on this walk and I said, what is stopping you from going all out? Why? I, I, I know what you can do because he was talented. He was great on the phone, great at writing emails, but there was something holding him back. And so I just am like, what is stopping you from going all out? And he just told me and opened up and it was a really emotional conversation that his dad, his whole life has told him, you're always going to be a B player. You're never going to be an A player because you don't try. And, and he had just grown up with that and lived with that. And when someone's constantly telling you that someone you look up to, that's, I mean, that's, that's really detrimental. I don't think parents realize, and I'm sure his dad never meant to have that much of an impact, but he broke down and said, I'm a B player. And that's what he thought of himself. And so, you know, I can't just say you're an A player. You can do this. It, it takes more than that. You actually have to do it. And I said, this month, let's just go all out. The worst that can happen is you don't hit your quota. And guess what? That's been happening for the last six months. So just go all out and see what you can do and prove it to yourself. And, and he really did. He went all out. He was coming in early, staying late, ask, meeting with everybody, getting advice from all the people around him. And you could see a material difference. And what's what was the really tough part, it ended up being a great ending. But the really tough part is you really need to be doing that. There's a 30-day lag with meetings yeah. and the activity that you do. And so when you start that at the beginning of the month, you couldn't, you can't really expect results until the month afterward. And so it was really cutting it right down to the wire if he was going to be able to hit his number or not that month and stay at the business. And luckily he did right in the nick of time. And because of all that momentum he had built up and realizing, okay, I know what this is going to take. He just kept that same energy level up and that same, I mean, it gave him this confidence. He, he was a different person afterwards. And so that's what I see with people. It's not necessarily something clicks where you say, oh, I, I now understand what the prospect really wants me to say or how to handle an objection. You know, all of that stuff is, is learned and it's, 
it becomes instinct the more the more and more that you do it. I think the real thing that holds people back sometimes, and it's different for everybody, but is that mental wall that you put up in your mind mm -hmm. that I don't know if I can do this or this is, I you know it's it's like the SDRs who hit if their quota is ten they're hitting eight or nine every single month, and it's like okay clearly if you're able to get to that number you can definitely get to 10, but it's this mental barrier that people put up that you have to help them break down. Yeah. I, yeah, uh, great story. Um, yeah. with, I, 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 I can totally relate. Like you were literally speaking about my one-on-ones last week, this week. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, great story. Um, mentals play, play all the role, right? Like they, they play so an important, like such an important role in, in BDR life and SDR life in, um whatever role you take but i think yeah. bdr profession really flushes this up to life or highlights this a lot um mm. just to maybe continue on that because one big question was you know what do you realize or what do you see with sdrs that sort of say make it right that break this mental barrier that hit quota month over month what are the things that you see in this people Mm -hmm. versus those that are not making it or are you know maybe pursuing another other profession what do yeah. you see good question i think most sdr leaders would probably say a combination of the same three or four things um and but i have one extra that i think makes a really big difference the basics in what we hire for is grit slash drive being driven and motivated uh coachability you need to be able to take feedback and we want you to have that growth mindset where you actually crave feedback and you're asking for it and proactively and then so important. Um, so important yeah that's a huge one communication skills are obviously really important uh so coachability communication skills drive um there's another one that i oh curiosity being really curious about what you're selling curious about uh and excited to be the best at whatever you're doing you know you can you can see sdrs who are really curious to learn outside of their role from their AEs, from CSMs, from marketing, they excel past their peers time and time again. The other big component that I uh, look for and that I see in really successful SDRs is optimism. There are SDRs- I heard this before, so good. You have? Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, good. Matt, Matt told me about it. He worked at Chili Piper, he grew their team. Mm -hmm. and oh yeah, there. yeah, I know. Maybe you know yeah. him, Matt Roberts. So he actually pointed it out in, in the last conversation, but continue. That's so important. Like, yeah, tell me what um, you understand on optimism. Right. So, so you know, just having a positive mindset and seeing, you know, it sounds so cliche, but seeing the glasses half full. There are SDRs who are great at all of those other characteristics that I described, and they spike in those areas. But when it comes to actually having a positive mindset. You know, they have the opposite mindset where, oh, this isn't coming in, or I'm complaining about my AEs, or this is why this isn't working. And it's fine. And they can usually grind, if they're really good, they can grind through and they can still get to their numbers. Um, but the people who everybody wants to see promoted or everybody wants on their team from the SDR org are the people that are excited, that add great energy. And those, those are the teams that the RD is on the AE team. They're coming to me and saying, I want this person on my team because they're going to add so much, you know, it's important to have that addition to your team culture. Um, and, and just being opti optimistic, you, you have to be, you have to think every no gets you this much, you know, 10% closer to a yes. Yeah. Every rejection means that the next thing it's going to be positive. It doesn't mean that today is a day full of rejections. So if you can look at it that way. You'll, you'll go so much further and have so much more success and be happier. I love it. I love that you highlight this because it's overlooked. You read to all the blogs, you know, you have like grit, curiosity, blah, 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 blah. But like very people are speaking, very few people are speaking about that. Be optimistic, right? Especially in a startup. Things are changing all the time. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, you have to be for, adaptable too. Because yeah. things, I mean, I think most SDRs are really adaptable because things change a lot, but hmm. that's a big one too. And you need people that look at change as a positive thing. Um, and not yeah. something that's frustrating or um, I mean, mm. you have to be as a leader, it's important to be good at change management, but yeah. I do think being adaptable yeah. is another great, yeah. great characteristic. 
That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing it. I know like you, you are, you said like processes are so important to you really want to like set up people for success. Um, and you have this, I think, I, I don't remember the specific name, but you have a specific program to help your SDRs getting ready, ready for an AE role. I think I read mm -hmm. this on, on your LinkedIn. Yes, it's called the AE Interview Readiness Program, and oh. it prepares SDRs to interview for the AE job. We have a program after that to prepare them even more for the AE job that involves mm -hmm. territory planning, forecasting, negotiation skills, and mentorship from a top AE. But this interview readiness training, um, it's part self-serve, and then there's where there's recorded trainings that we have for them to go through. And then there's exercises and certifications to go through to get ready for the interview. Because we want, if they don't pass the interview, they have to redo it the next quarter. And that's mm -hmm. three more months on our team, which we love to have them, but we want you off. We want you to get promoted and move. And and, and we also have so many AEs that we're hiring for. SDRs perform two times better than external hires that we make um, on our growth AE team. And it, it makes sense, right? They know product. They, they know how to do their own outbound with segment. And so um, we want them moving and being that talent pipeline for the org. Um, so that's, it's really to help ensure that the, as, as many that, that can pass do pass and, and yeah. can move up. They've been through the Lawrence school before, so they know exactly how, how to get to the next step. No, But it's actually interesting. So our um, two of my managers, uh, mm -hmm. actually, um, almost all of my managers have sales closing experience, but two of them um, have their their uh, previous roles before they became SDR managers here mm -hmm. were closing roles, being AEs at other companies, mm -hmm. Zoom and Intercom. And when they came in, they were really passionate about putting together the interview readiness program and then the bridge program to build SDR yeah. skills before they, to help them ramp faster. And so they put all of those together, Jessica Smith and Kato Hanlon, and those programs are fantastic because it's all the things that they wish they had had when they moved from SDR to AE. And so yeah. that's what we're, we're trying to recreate. Yeah. I, lo I love it. Thanks for, it's such a difficult step. Like every SDR says, I want like most of them say, I want to be an AE. I want to start closing. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the times you realize that the AE role isn't the role you, you thought it would be as an, as an from an SDR perspective. So What, like, to just put it in simple terms, when do you think an SDR is ready to become an AE? Hmm. Uh, if they're, so, I mean, for us, if they're able to hit 100% of quota for six months, usually at that point, by the time they're able to do that, they're probably minimum 10 months into the role, um, maybe 12. And the deal sizers are pretty big for our growth AE team. Um, they're definitely a lot larger than I think you'd expect. And, and so it is still, it is still a jump, but the fact that they do, you know, they get inbound, they do qualification calls, they're talking to the buyers on a regular basis. Um, so I think, you know, I think the sweet spot is probably 15 months on for most people on average, because you need, you really do need a minimum of six months of doing the same thing over and over. It's not enough to hit quota once or twice and say, great, I know how to do it. I can move on. When I was an SDR, I was in the role for four months and I went to the VP of our corporate sales team and I said, okay, I'm ready for an AE job. And he just laughed at me like, okay, you mm. need many more months of doing the same thing. And, yeah. and that's what, you know, you, you want them to have that consistency and that repetition because not that it's luck at all. When you hit quota the first or second time, it's not. But you, there's this grind that comes in to do it consistently over and over and develop that rhythm in motion so that it's you're constant, you constantly have your own SDR pipeline and you're constantly, you know, closing out and moving it forward every single month. So once they can get in that rhythm, I do think six months is a, is a you know, good test of time to be able to do that. Um, they, for our team, they can't move before 12 months enroll, but we, you know, Uh, once they hit 12 months, they're able to, they're, they're eligible to interview or move into the next role. Great. Did that answer your question? Definitely, definitely. Um, okay. <laughs> also, also on the point, you know, what you said, like, 
maturity wise they have done some qualification before they have done some disqualification before they've like handled different objections and so forth um but oh think, yeah you know um i think it's great to also have this this time horizon like a lot of the times you are like you said by yourself right F four months i mean i can do that move on right mm -hmm. but there's actually so much more to explore in this role um yeah that was that was great um we are running short on time i know you're super busy and um, so maybe last question you have a, sh a sharp yeah question. i do by the way i do have 10 more minutes or i'm i have my next meeting at the 15 mark so okay. i have like 10 or 12 minutes if you if you do i'm happy to answer yeah more, it's, the end of, it's the end of my day i'm staying saying long in the office okay. um so so no um because i would love to continue speaking to you of course um it's a really interesting one. I mean, we all read your case study. I think I've shared it with everyone. It's greatly oh, written. You. No, it's like, honestly, because it's super actionable, right? Um, mm. What happened there from 12 qualified ops to 25 qualified ops? What happened there? Like, how, how do you get your team from 12 to 25 qualified ops? Uh, I mean, probably only 10% of the changes that we made are outlined in that article. Maybe, maybe more because changing the workflow and the structure was huge, but I walked into a gold mine. I don't want to, I don't want to say that every team can double production because sometimes you already have something great going and you can increase it and you can optimize it, but doubling it might be out of the picture. What really happened was we had, I had a team of 30 outbound SDRs who weren't doing outbound. They had never made cold calls. And ever, mm -hmm. there was no phones on the floor. There was no dialer to use. Okay. And they yeah. weren't writing personalized emails and they were spending, they were getting, you know, a list of accounts or leads every week and then just blasting them with messaging that somebody else had written. And this, I mean, the emails they were sending were like five paragraphs long. They mentioned the word segment every single sentence. It was all about us. And so there was a ton that we did. We went through command of the message boot camp with all of our sellers and all of our SDRs. We had a another command of the message bootcamp with SDR. So getting our messaging on point, um, getting them into the same language and using the same sales methodology as our sellers were getting trained on. That was huge that they were a part of it. I think it cost a lot more because we have a big team to, to have them part of it, but it was so important because that's, it's an investment, right? We invest so much in them early on because we want them here for the long haul and to matriculate up through the organization. So that was a piece of it. A big part of it was like, we went to Target and got a soccer ball, wrote objections on it. Uh, you know, can't talk yeah. right now, I'm not the right person. And we would toss it around in the office every day. The first time we ever did cold calls, we, we, we got Chipotle for the team. All the managers got on the phone. We tried to make it really fun. We're tossing the soccer ball around. We're practicing our pitches. And then the first time we ever did a call blitz with our team, we booked, in, I think in the day we booked 20 meetings, but in that, hour and a half long call blitz, we booked 12. And so that was, I mean, I remember as years were like, there's no way we're going to book meetings on the phone. People don't, pe there's no way people are going to answer. And I think for all of us who have been SDRs and probably thought the same thing in our first three or four days as we were training, and then you get on the phone, people do answer the phone. And anyone who says cold calling is dead is, I don't know how they're- It's interesting how, how it comes up all the time, right? I know. It's like there's I no nothing more effective. There's literally I think people right just now, like writing controversial things on exactly. LinkedIn. There's nothing more effective than than a, than an SD rep who can handle the phone. It's just like yeah. that. And it just makes them so much better as a seller too, because you're audible ready. You can pivot, you know how to answer questions, you feel you build that confidence. I don't think that emails or sending videos builds the confidence that cold calling does in any way, shape or form, because it's a live call where it's not an inbound call where somebody's saying, I want to talk to you. It's completely outbound and they might not want to talk to you. And you need to go through that rejection. It's the rite of passage, honestly. Um, but it builds, it builds you up. So, so that was a big piece of it. Um, getting people to cold call. Cause that just, I mean, like tripled the amount of meetings that we were able to book as a team, right? Mm -hmm. We had just never leverage that channel. We also weren't doing anything on video. We also weren't following up with webinar registrants or attendees or people who downloaded content that was just in a black hole in the abyss. And so we created reports and dashboards for them to get those warm leads. 
because you're still going outbound and cold, cold outbounding on your target accounts, but there's also warm leads from those accounts engaging yeah. that know the name segment. So let's call them. So there are a lot was, of people I felt like I walked segment. into, what'd you say? There are a lot of people that know segment. I mean, come on, if you don't know segment, then yeah, exactly. I know it's so that, so I have to say that helped so much, right? It's like, it was walking into a gold mine. Mm. Um, at first I was really shocked. I was thinking they've never cold called. They've never written personalized emails. The outreach instance was, um, I can't even tell you what it looked like. It was just a complete mess. And it just felt like, wow, I did not know I was walking into this, but quickly realized, and I'm really optimistic by nature, if you don't know that already, and was just thinking, wow, this is the best possible scenario because there's only one way to go from here and that's up. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we did. You, you would get hired by yourself, Lauren, with that optimism. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah, it makes makes a lot of sense. And thanks for, for clarifying. Um, we had a similar journey from going from five to 12 meetings in the last six months. Nice, um, congratulations. That's yeah, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know, like we, similar things as you, you said, like it started with hiring the right people, right? Mm -hmm. Hiring for the positivity mindset and hiring for grit. Um, and then just, you know, getting, getting more structure into that. And um, I think uh, for, for onboarding, and I think that that would be my next segue question is onboarding them in a huddle um, in a team um, mm -hmm. was, was great because they could help each other. Um, so what do you think makes up? Because again, you love processes. You, you love to set people up for success. Mm -hmm. What do you think is like the source of a successful SDR onboarding? And I think it's two months that you were actually, mm -hmm. right? Which is, we just which is, changed it. Which and is quite started. long, which yeah, is quite I long. Know. We I had two weeks. I know. No, it was three weeks prior and now it's two months, but it, they're still productive during those two months. Um, by that, I mean generating pipeline. Um, so something I didn't mention when answering your last question about going from... Um, just increasing as your predicted by 100%. It's not increasing. It's for 12 to 25, Lauren. Don't <laughs> underestimate here. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> by almost insane. 100%, yeah. <laughs> Increase. Um, one of the other big pieces is the feedback loop. We're constantly asking feedback. I've been an SDR. I want their job. I know that admin work sucks and it takes up way too much time. So what, can, what things can we automate in their workflow? What things can we remove from them so that they have less clicks, less places that they have to go to uh, for multiple things? Um, so we try to do that with onboarding too, is reduce the amount. We're constantly going back. How can we make their workflow better? Because at the end of the day, it's how fast can you get through these loops and get people into sequence and, you know, pull them through that sequence and sprint on them. And so we try to, that's what we teach in onboarding for, for like the one, you know, success or the one thing that hinges on the success, or I don't know, I don't know, know your actual question. Was it what makes successful onboarding? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I Second. wanted to make sure I got that right. Um, gosh, I don't know. There's so many things. I don't know if there's one golden ticket to, to have a really successful onboarding program. I think what, what we've recently done that's been, we just finished with our first cohort. We totally copied outreach and Sam Nelson and his Agoji format. It's a little bit different uh, mm -hmm. just for our business, but it's really similar where the people that come in, they have a dedicated manager and that manager, she was a top SDR on our team. When she told me she wanted to be a manager, I was ecstatic because it's the dream person that you would want on your management team. Someone who's so overly optimistic, so excited to help other people to build and just an incredible person and energy to be around. And she, her name is Kelly Lyons. She manages all of the brand new people that start. So we have 11 starting on August 23rd and she'll manage them for two full months and then we'll have our next class come in. And once the next class comes in and, and this class graduates, they move to their future managers teams. The, I think what has made it, the what's increased the success rate of people coming out of onboarding. In the beginning, we had a ton of live trainings. You learn from this person, we schedule this. That's exhausting for the trainers. You're constantly training the same thing over and over again. So we said, let's record for the ones that we can record. Let's record a 
great version of this in engaging, you know, really high energy presentation. And then let's have either a, an ask me anything or a Q&A session right after they watch the recording or in a live exercise because that live trainings do make a huge difference. So we'll have them watch like anything that's process related and then they can go back, they can rewatch it. They can, you know, if they, they want to learn at their own pace, then we'll do a live exercise or Q and a with the trainer or somebody that's trained on that topic so that they can ask any outstanding questions so that we still get that live aspect that is really helpful. And then for most of them, we'll have either like a certification or a presentation. So after they go through all of the tools, then they'll do a PG pipeline generation presentation where they, mm -hmm. they, we, we um, give them one of their accounts that they're going to get once they are, once they around three or four weeks, they get their account list, mm -hmm. we give them one of their accounts. They pick, uh, they, they identify the best prospects because we've done prospecting training, LinkedIn training, all that. Then they choose, they tell us why they chose them. Then they write it, a personalized email to them. Then they create a personalized video for them. And then they do a mock call live with the trainer or with their manager. And that's, that kind of wraps up everything that we've just taught them when it comes to the tools and then applying them. So we try to, I mean, I've, I've read so many articles and case studies on like how people learn and it's in remote world, you have to still incorporate that even more so because you recognize like, you know, it's not easy to just sit on zoom all day long training after training. So we do a ton of shadowing where they, they get an SDR mentor and they shadow them for two hours, watching their workflow, asking questions as they go. So I think there's a lot of components that are necessary, but the certifications and the presentations really tie it all together and help them apply what they're learning. So if I could recommend anything, that would be, that would be it. Have some, have some badges, certifications, presentations to help people apply what they're learning. Fantastic. Yeah. I remember I worked for a startup, so I didn't like, get like a trophy, but like mm -hmm. my, my, uh, like at Salesforce, for example, you get like this trophy, right? It's like here. Oh, you, I love that. You, oh, you see that. the onboarding. Yeah. It's super cool. Uh, I have a lot of friends here. So copying some, some ideas. Uh, we like, send them a ring light and a whiteboard. Um, there you go. And the book fanatical prospecting, but just <laughs> so they that can plant, you have to read it. Uh -huh, <laughs> I know. That was the yeah. most, probably the be most influential book um, that I read as an SDR. Yeah, same, same here. I would say this one and Chris Voss, um, the negotiating book. I never split mm -hmm. the difference. Never split the difference, yeah. Exactly. Um, Ethics. And also um, gap selling. I find we, on Challenger sales was also. Mm, I haven't read gap selling. Gap selling, yeah, we, we have a book club. So we read one book every month uh, with nice. the team. Um, so, so this is right now on the, on the reading list. Um, we are closing down Lauren, you have, you have to jump on the next call. There are two questions that I, I would like to ask. You can decide which you want, if you want, whatever. And the okay. first one is like, what would you tell to like your, when you go back, when, when you were an SDR, what would you tell your younger self from what you've learned? Mm hmm. 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 That's a good question. Um, it would probably be something about work-life balance. And even though I got to travel a lot for work and traveled outside of work, um, I was so obsessive about it, especially for my first three years, where it was everything I lived and breathed. And not that I think it, like, there was nothing super detrimental that came from that, but I think there's probably, you know, fun nights or weekends or trips that I missed out on and would have loved having those as memories if I, if I, you know, didn't work every Sunday. Um, and so I think I've, you know, hopefully mellowed out over the years a little bit with that, but that would probably be the biggest one because at the end of the day, if you're showing up and doing great work, you know, it's, it's important to re refresh. And every time that I go on vacation or take a week off, you just realize how much you needed it. And it shouldn't get to that point. You should do that before <laughs> before you get to the point I of, can relate. I feel like I'm gonna burn out if I don't take a week off. Yeah, yeah. no, thanks, Lauren. Last one is how do you keep your team motivated? Oh gosh, that one is tough. I feel like I have done 
a terrible job at that during COVID. I am, I love being in person. I love going around the floor, hyping people up, giving them high fives, doing team huddles, going outside, you know, tossing a ball around, getting excited for a call blitz. Um, you know, we do, we do spiffs and we try to make them really exciting and have big stretch goals. Um, I think probably this is so sad to say it in my all hands, even, I don't even feel like I'm like that motivating. It's probably, we do, I send out an SDR newsletter every other week and I'll write it's, it's long form. Um, and it's like all of the details that they need to know for everything that they need in their job. It has everything in it. Um, so I would really love great. to get this. I would love to get this. Oh my God. Well, it's just internal stuff. Like exactly. Uh, still, still so interesting. <laughs> yeah. And so I'll usually write at the beginning of that, I'll write, you know, I'll talk about how we're doing and how far we've come. And I think that, you know, I've gotten feedback from the SDRs that it's really helpful to see and like hear the way that I'm thinking about how we've grown as a business and where we're going. Um, so I, I think being really transparent with data and just showing them the chart of how far we've come. I mean, that one that was in the um, outreach case study, that's that's so exciting for them to see mm -hmm. because they're yeah. part of that and they've, they've helped build that. And it's also really motivating for the managers. Yeah. So I don't know, I, I lean into data a lot, um, but I feel like I wish, I, I want to learn from people. I want to learn from you how you mo motivate your SDRs because I feel like it's, it's tough right now because it's like who wants to have another meeting on the calendar? You don't want to, overcrowd mm -hmm. their their schedules um but i yeah i can't wait till we're back in the office and i need to do a better job about motivating people remotely because i don't think i've cracked the code on that one quite yet yeah no it's 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 a difficult one like what we do is um we have every like we have the morning huddle so in in, in the end we let the reps share a motivational quote Right, so they nominate each other to share something motivational, whether oh, it's Olympics, that. you know, uh, whether it's football, whether it's a book they wrote, a poem they read. So they they share a quote, and then they mm. say how that's going to impact how they think, and that's quite fun because they nominate each other. And yeah. Oh, I love that. Okay, that actually so, reminds me. This I don't I haven't done this, but my um, one of my managers who is a fantastic culture carrier, her mm -hmm. name's Diana Atkinson. She has former SDRs who are now AEs or product marketing managers come into her meetings and share what advice that they would give themselves, you know, when they started the SDR role, mm -hmm. when um, she also has uh, people on her team take turns sharing their why. So why are they yeah. here? Why are they passionate? Simon and Sinek. that is huge. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. so I, I need to do, we need to do that more because it, it makes a big difference. Yeah. We, we, we are like, I, I'm a Simon Sinek ambassador. So I did it with the entire company. Um, I, I have a podcast episode on this. If you would like to listen to that, I'd love to. <laughs> um, that sounds great. I, I can I can share that. It's with SDR Nation. I did one. Um, it's 20 minutes. It might fit into your schedule if you would like to. Um, I know yeah, that you have to run. Um, how did you like that? How did you? Perceive it was that great. That Thanks for asking me all the questions. Yeah. Hopefully, I think I end up taking. I didn't. I looked at them beforehand, but I didn't type any notes out. So, and that's exactly what I want, Lauren. That's exactly what I want because there's so much scripted, unreal content out there. That's not real stories, right? The stories yeah. that you do share right now, they are so actionable. There's so much more than reading another blog post that, you know, is not maybe written by you from yeah. outreach. And it's these real stories that make a true impact i feel so I, i'm it was a great conversation one of the best i had so far and i had 15 by now so thank you so wow. much Lauren, for, for that yeah yeah thank you for uh reaching yeah. out and it was so great to meet you and if there's ever anything i can do to help please uh let me know and i'll keep consuming all the great content that you're putting out i think if everybody that posts on linkedin could just realize don't make it about you it doesn't if, if you're doing it for likes it's never who's gonna like it It just needs to be actual, like you said, real. Value. Like if I'm never going to post any article that I've posted. Hopefully you've seen this. I'm never, and that's why I only think I have three on LinkedIn or like the outreach blog post. I'm never going to post something that's just like high level. It's like if I'm an SDR leader or I'm somebody that, mm. you know, the audience of who's reading whatever I'm writing, I want them to be able to go take something away and implement it. I, yeah. when people don't give examples or actually how they did something. I'm just like, okay, this is nice conceptually, but I want to actually see a real life example 
so I can apply this to what I'm doing. So I, I appreciate that you, you look at the content you, that you produce the same way. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Great, Lauren. Um, there are a million other questions I would like to ask you. There are a million other things um, I would speak to you about, um, but you're busy. I, I let you go with your day.